John Garlock. I chair the Education Committee of the Rochester Labor Council. And uh, are you going to join us, Bill, or are you having a siesta? Okay, Bill can have a siesta. Uh, Bill McClure, the Metro Justice, uh, did the honors this morning. Um, so, welcome to uh, this final session of our public hearing on fair work or fair wages. Uh, the sponsors, the Rochester Labor Council, the Pettengill Labor Education Fund, uh, Metro Justice, the Workers' Center, and Power. Uh, we all hope that this event will uh, heighten awareness of low-wage work, contribute to an ongoing discussion of the issues, and importantly, lead to actions to improve the condition of low-wage workers. So, the first session we tried to define what is low-wage work, uh, particularly in Rochester, but also in general. And uh, this morning's session, we looked at, uh, we heard testimony from a bunch of low-wage workers from the fast food, uh, health, and uh, uh, education sectors. And what we're here to do in this session is to talk about what is to be done. Um, because there are organizations in the community that are uh, advocating uh, different strategies to uh, move low-wage workers out of poverty. So let me introduce the presenters who will talk about those programs and the panelists who will ask the questions. Uh, Jake Allen is a Fight for 15 organizer. Jake. Uh, Bruce Popper, Executive Vice President of the Labor Council and Vice President for Healthcare Workers 1199. Uh, Jeff Mazansky from the Advisory Committee uh, uh, of Power. And Louis Torres, Executive Director of Power. And each of them will have 15 minutes uh, to make his presentation and uh, we'll time them, which we'll go over. And then there will be 10 minutes after each presentation for members of the uh, panel uh, to ask questions for purposes of clarification about the presentation. So let me introduce our panelists. Uh, Barbara Galeo, former uh, director of the New York Civil Liberties Union Genesee Valley Chapter. And uh, Reverend Marla Washington, who's pastor at Christ Community Church. So let's jump right in. Jake, you're up first. I'm a volunteer organizer with the Fight for 15 and a staff organizer with SEIU Local 200 United. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, not, to, not to turn this into a book report, but I wanted to um, give you a, a brief history of the, of the fast food industry to sort of set the context for um, how we got here today. Um, and you'll have to bear with me, I'm getting over a cold right now. Um, but um, although it might seem to folks my age or younger, um, that uh, it would be unimaginable to have a world without fast food. Um, the industry is actually pretty young. Uh, it began in the 1950s uh, by a group of businessmen whose primary aim was from the outset to reduce costs to the lowest levels possible. Uh, that's the principle that's guided the development of that industry ever since. Um, they were able to accomplish that goal through a number of different means. Um, one was by making customers do some of the work for them. Uh, think about, you know, maybe the last time you went to a McDonald's or a Wendy's. You go up to the counter, you order the food there, you take it back to your seat yourself, uh, you, and you take your own garbage and carry it to the garbage can yourself. All of that reduces the need, eliminates the need for busboys, for waiters, for waitresses, for hosts, for hostesses. Um, Another way was to create a franchise system which would allow them to maintain control over the product 
uh, and give them a guaranteed rate of return, while at the same time allowing local owners to create a, a low-wage workforce that best suited local conditions. Um, but perhaps the most important way that they were able to reduce costs was through the implementation of a production process that, um, when it was first invented, uh, generated some of America's first industrial magnates, which was the, the uh, factory line model, the assembly line model. Um, and some of you may have read the book Fast Food Nation by Eric Schlosser. Sound familiar? Um, in, in his book, he writes that for the first time, um, this is around the 1950s, the guiding principles of a factory assembly line were applied to a commercial kitchen, if you'll allow me to just read this to you for a second. Uh, the new division of labor meant that a worker only had to be taught how to perform one task. Skilled and expensive short order cooks were no longer necessary. Instead of relying upon a small, stable, well-paid, and well-trained workforce, the fast food industry seeks out unskilled workers who are willing to accept low pay. So low pay was part of the, the design for this industry from the get-go. Um, and it's worth noting here, I tried to find a spot to mention this, but attitudes towards um, fast food workers that are prevalent today are actually some of the same attitudes that were prevalent towards factory workers um, during the advent of capitalism. Um, you know, why do these people deserve a raise? Why do they deserve a living wage? All they do is pull leather all day. These are the same kind of attitudes you hear towards fast food workers. And the solution then is the same, uh, the, the solution then is the same as today, which is for workers to organize themselves um, and to unionize. Um, but the part where he ended there where he says, you know, unskilled workers who are willing to accept low pay, that part can't be emphasized enough. In 1972, McDonald's own Ray Kroc, then the CEO of the company, uh, lobbied Congress and the White House to pass new legislation known as the McDonald's Bill, which would have allowed employers to pay 16 and 17 year olds 20% below the minimum wage. And they haven't dropped this since. There was another, uh, recently I think in Oregon, they tried to pass another similar bill, which failed. Um, but that's, <laughs> they, they've spent, uh, since 1989, they've spent something like $51 million um, that has been put directly in the pockets of candidates that, that, that they think will support an agenda like this. Um, in describing his own business philosophy, Ray Kroc uh, was later quoted as saying, this is a rat-eat-rat-dog-eat-dog -dog system. I'll kill them, and I'm going to kill them before they kill me. You're talking about the American way of survival of the fittest. Referring to his competitors, and this is the one that really got me, he said, uh, if they were drowning to death, I put a hose in their mouth. Um, what Ray Kroc is expressing in these statements is the logic of capitalism taken to its fullest. And it's that logic that made the fast food industry what it is today. Um, so taking things forward into the future today, um, fast food, this, none of this comes as any surprise to people, but fast food in the current culture that surrounds it is immense. Uh, the Golden Arches have become an American icon, although today, uh, McDonald's exists in 119 countries. And just to put that in perspective, there are only 196 countries in the entire world. So of those 196, 119 have McDonald's locations. Um, it's no accident that the grip of fast food on the American psyche is so deep. Marketing experts have worked tirelessly to keep fast food at the forefront of America's food choices, uh, even selecting a color scheme, you may have heard of this. Um, that studies have shown induce hunger. That red-yellow combo supposedly at some psychological level induces hunger. Um, and while it exists in 119 countries, fast food is not only a global industry, it's also one of the most profitable. According to the National Restaurant Association, what I affectionately refer to as the other NRA, uh, fast food today is a $683 billion industry. Uh, with the average CEO making over a thousand times more than the average worker. A thousand times more than the average worker. So let that, let that set in for a second. These are some of the most well-paid executives in the country, while their workers are some, among some of the lowest paid, most making just above the minimum wage. The median uh, wage for a fast food worker is somewhere around $8.60 an hour. Um, it's, it's almost as if their wealth is the result of their workers' poverty. I've seen this movie before. Uh, compounding the problem of poor wages is the extremely common occurrence of wage theft in the industry. 
Um, some of you may have heard stories about this. In a survey done in New York City, 84% uh, of respondents, 84%, reported being victims of wage theft over the last year. And wage theft can come in a number of different forms. Um, workers being required to work off the clock, cashiers being required to pay their employer if their till comes up short, uh, or workers not receiving overtime pay for working more than 40 hours. Um, and sometimes it comes in really insidious, uh, excuse me, innocuous forms. Uh, you know, I've heard many stories of bosses asking a worker after they've clocked out for a break or for lunch, or even at the end of the day, saying, hey, come help me with something real quick. Well, it's actually a really valuable educational tool when talking to a worker to sit down and say, okay, how many times in an average week do you think that happens? Now let's multiply that over the course of a year. That's how much money your employer owes you, often hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, and that's extra money, extra labor that comes into the, into the organization. Um, paid little, subjected to wage theft. Workers are treated as only another expendable cog in the fast food assembly line. Uh, when they face an issue alone, their grievances usually go unnoticed, or in some rare cases where a worker knows and is willing to exert their rights, uh, they may eventually take it for the National Labor Relations Board. Um, this actually happened here recently in Rochester where a worker was fired for reporting a gas leak. And after two years, um, finally, uh, it finally had a resolution. Um, but in the few instances where this happens, where this does happen, workers face courts that have become increasingly sympathetic towards employers, as almost a century of pro-employer court rulings have shown. Um, and should they ultimately win some justice, it's usually years after the dispute was initially raised and the worker has likely moved on. Um, one of the best examples that I like to cite is, um, this actually just came out in the news, in the news recently, um, uh, a worker involved in the IWW's Starbucks Workers Campaign, uh, Starbucks Workers Union, uh, down in New York City, who was fired for his organizing efforts back in 2005, just last month, won his job back after nine years of deliberating the case in court. How many workers do you think have the stamina, the, 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 uh, you know, the, the, the willingness to accept that kind of frustration, to stick with that kind of a process for nine years. Not very many. Um, leave it to a wobbly, I guess. Um, so I would say, you know, um, relying on these outside forces, forces that aren't under our control, uh, you know, the courts, the government, the state, uh, that's the least effective way to deal with uh, worker management disputes or the, the crisis that faces fast food workers in general. Um, and I would contend that the only solution to that is a union, worker self-organization. Um, and I would distinguish here, you know, I know there's some labor folks in the room, so this might be review for you, but um, I would distinguish here between the traditional National Labor Relations Board organizing where, um, you know, workers sign union cards and it goes to a vote, then they win the election, um, which shifts the struggle away from framing it as winning demands onto winning a vote. Um, and instead, they have framed, uh, excuse me, instead workers are engaging in a form of organizing which can still function even if workers don't have a majority of support in their workplace. Instead of carefully tiptoeing through the minefield of pro-employer labor law, workers are engaging in direct action to apply pressure directly against the boss. Up until recently, such direct action has consisted mainly of strikes and pick pickets, which is no small feat. Uh, however, at a recent convention of 1,300 fast food workers that occurred a few months ago, uh, those in attendance committed unanimously to expanding the range of tactics to include civil disobedience, a hopeful move. Uh, by using these tactics, workers have already won some significant victories. In a recent report submitted to the Securities and Exchange Commission, McDonald's acknowledged that the impact of such events, and I'm quoting here, as boycotts, protests, or labor strikes can, quote-unquote, adversely affect us, unquote, and may spur higher wages. 
Such an open acknowledgment of the impact of worker self-activity is rare and amounts to an incredibly positive sign as to the effectiveness of these tactics. More recently in Rochester, uh, a worker's strike at the East Ridge Wendy's forced them to close their doors uh, during their morning shift. Some of you might have been out there for that. Um, they were forced to lock their doors that morning because of the actions that workers took. Um, and it forced them to bring the concerns of the workers there to the immediate attention of the bosses. The, uh, the regional general manager spent every day in that store for the following at least a week or two, um, tending to every, he was their best friend in the following weeks. Um, workers saw some small but immediate victories, like I said, in, in the terms of uh, the settlement of some scheduling issues that have been ongoing at the store. And we can expect to see more victories will follow as these strikes expand. Um, that victory is impossible here, that, that victory is possible here is unquestionable. Um, Denmark fast food workers, for example, earn $20 an hour, um, far beyond the $15 an hour that's being fought for by American workers. Um, what is in question is the extent to which Workers and the surrounding communities that they live in are willing to stand up and fight for something better. The question is whether or not some of the people in this room will be out there with us during our next strike date that's going to be happening within the next few months. I won't specify the date. But I hope that I can count on everyone in this room will be there on the picket line with those workers when they go out on strike. And in the meantime, I hope that you'll join one of our committees uh, that has been created to uh, support these workers in their fight for $15 an hour in a year. Thank you, Jake. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, how the, the figure of 15 was arrived at for the fight for 15 and, and what you anticipate that would be in terms of is this a five-year plan? Is this a one-year plan? And what are you thinking about that? Or what is being thought about, not you individually, but? A lot of those decisions happen at a much higher level than you know, what I'm doing. Um, but um, $15 an hour uh, was arrived at, I think, inspired in many ways um, by you know, recent legislation that's been passed in other cities. Um, I think Seattle was a, a big part of that. But, um, I mean, that would, it's almost double the current uh, minimum wage in this country. Um, and as far as the time frame, um, I hate to put any estimates on it at the risk of being wrong, but, um, you know, there's, I think there's hope within the next 12 months we'll see some kind of a breakthrough with these companies. Um, I don't want to go into too many details about that. But. I, I understand that. Because the cost of living in, in the Rochester metropolitan area, even at $15 an hour, you're not, you're not meeting the cost of living that has been, that's public information. I don't have it right. It's probably in one of these reports down here. But a person working 40 hours a week, right. it's still not making enough money to meet the minimum cost of living to live in Monroe County. So right. and I, I didn't mention it in. Uh, my, my talk, but um, you know, Rochester it was in the news recently, I'm sure you all know, this is the third poorest city in the country right now. And at the time that we decided to pursue this campaign through Metro Justice, uh, we selected this campaign because not only were we the third poorest city in the country, but we, we also had a below average unemployment rate. Not much below average. But what that said to us was that the issue here wasn't a lack of jobs, it's that the jobs that exist suck, frankly. They suck. Um, yeah. Um, and so, you know, what we said is we need to improve uh, the jobs that exist and we need to do it through a means of organizing that's sort of asymmetrical, um, that doesn't go through the designated channels that have stymied unions for decades. Um, given the fact with the fight for 15, do you see that perhaps a different train of organizing is required with the fight for 15 than, say, with organizing traditional union base? And if so, can you talk about that? I mean, it, it's, it, it completely circumvents 
the whole process of forming legally recognized unions. It says, you know, workers are saying, forget the law, we're going to come together and organize uh, on the basis of solidarity and nothing more, and we're going to fight. It's, I mean, it sounds overly simplistic, but that's, that's what it is. I mean, typically there's this very, and I, you know, through my job with SAU, this is what I do every day. Uh, you know, you, workers sign union cards, at least, you know, a third of the workforce has to sign union cards, which triggers an election. Uh, then you have to win that vote, which if through some miracle you manage to do, uh, with the way that uh, the cards are stacked against unions, um, if you happen to win that vote, then the boss is required to sit down and negotiate a contract, but many unions which win a, a union vote can't get a contract within the first year. So it's this long, drawn-out process that's designed to drag workers down um, and demoralize them. Um, and instead, workers, as I said before, that frames the whole struggle around winning a vote. Instead, workers in fast food are saying, we want to win demands, and we're going to do it by a applying pressure directly against the boss. And we're not even going to necessarily rely on having, I mean, obviously the goal is to reach a majority in these workplaces, but we're willing to work, you know, with a minority, even if, you know, it came to a vote, we wouldn't win. Um, that's the inspiring thing to me about this, is that, you know, workers are taking action regardless of the circumstances. Uh, you alluded, uh, Jake, to the, the, the value of the, of the um importance of allies for these actions and I'd like to just give you another opportunity to flesh that out a little bit more because you know in one way of thinking workers are on the line if I complain as a worker I run the risk of losing my job I run the risk of the word getting out and not getting hired and there are 15 people behind me who are unemployed who will work for nothing so I, I lose a lot but the allies that are particularly people in this room have a very important role to play and I'd like you just to flesh that out a little bit thank you I mean, the, it probably comes as no surprise to anyone in this room that the law is a weak defense for workers. The law wasn't written for or written by workers, and you know, since the National Labor, La Nation National Labor Relations Act was created, um, as positive a step as it might have been when it was created, it's been slowly whittled away uh, in the following almost a century now, uh, to the point where it's actually an obstacle to many workers. Um, and so. Because workers can't rely on the state in any effective way to defend them, what can they depend on? I mean, really, what else do they have other than each other and their community? The people in this room. Um, and that can take a number of different forms. Um, I was very impressed at the number of people that came out during the last strike. Um, we had probably about 100 supporters that came out for those workers during the course of the day. Uh, next time around, I'd like to see 300. Could we make that happen? Um, because workers, I don't think workers really got a sense that they were a part of a movement until they saw that. Until they saw, look at, and I heard comments from workers, look at all these people that came out for me. You know, I thought I was all alone. Or that our store was all alone. That it was just the, you know, 10 of us over here at East 320s. Then a hundred community activists poured out to support them. Um, and, you know, if workers face retaliation, um, as I said here, they're not going through these, like, many year long legal procedures to win their jobs back. They're taking direct action, again, to win their jobs back. They're doing it by, in many places, community allies are the ones that actually walk them back into work and help them uh, win those jobs back, and actually Reverend Marla Washington was one of the folks that did that with us this year. And, you know, we have big hands. But that's incredibly important. Um, workers need to know that if they face any sort of retaliation, um, that people like us are going to be there to stand behind them. Um, beyond, you know, strike day, um, there's a lot that's going to happen between now and then. Um, we've set up a whole bunch of different committees that support these workers, including a media committee, a research committee, um, a, a legal defense committee, um, most importantly, uh, an organizing committee, which is the committee that's actually of, of volunteers like me that are going out and talking to workers about the movement that their co-workers have created all over the country. Um, in the 
the, the responses are incredibly positive always. You know, I'll, you know, I'll, which doesn't necessarily mean that every worker you talk to is going to go out on strike. But um, it's rare to find a worker that says, "No, I don't want improvements at, at my job." Um, so, if what we need is help with those committees, either you know, uh, developing our relationship with the media, developing our own independent media within the organization, helping out with research, or most importantly, as I said, going out and having those conversations with workers. We need as much help in that arena as we can get. Thank you. How do people volunteer for the committee? Um, well, um, folks can talk to me after this is done, and uh, there's also, um, you can check out Metro Justice's website uh, for more information. Um, and like I said, I'd be happy to, to talk to folks after this if they're interested in being a part of this movement. Great. Thank you, Jay. Good afternoon. You know we got to do this twice. Good afternoon. Thank you. Um, I would like to first start by uh, noting uh, the loss of a great organizer. Uh, this week on Thursday we lost Bob Worth. Uh, Bob was a president of Metro Justice in the early 70s. Uh, he made Metro Justice a bit famous in law schools with the Supreme Court case Worth, Worth versus Selden. Now, that was a housing discrimination suit lodged by Metro Justice against the town of Penfield for building specifications that meant only rich people could build houses there. <clears throat> um, unfortunately, and it became uh, a standard bearer a decision um, that set the standard for who has standing to sue. Unfortunately, the Supreme Court did not say Metro Act had standing to sue, but so it is now taught in law schools all over the place. Bob most recently, among his many projects, was a executive committee and board member of Rochester Acts, which I'm going to mention later. That is a Gamaliel Foundation project that we are trying to get a clergy-based organizing project, Alinsky-style, going in Rochester. And there'll be a major convention of that group uh, on November 15, uh, next Saturday. And Laura's here, too, a member of our board. Um, <clears throat> so I'll get into that. Um, I was going to make a speech, but I agree with everything Jake said, so I can sit down now. Uh, I guess I won't. John will. <clears throat> so let me get into some of my remarks. Um, in a period of United States history containing lessons for our own, low wage workers rose up in rebellion against the accumulation of excessive wealth by the top 1%, against record income inequality, against poor working conditions, against their impoverishment, and against the government that let these excesses lead to the crash of the entire economy. They engaged in protests, demonstrations, work stoppages, and strikes. This was the 1930s. Whether truly believing in economic justice or merely to save capitalism from an actual revolution, President Franklin Roosevelt set out to grant some limited power to low-wage workers by proposing the National Labor Relations Act. But to gain congressional approval, Roosevelt needed Southern Democrats to support the legislation. And to get that support, Roosevelt agreed that the National Labor Relations Act would not cover low-wage jobs held primarily by people of color. So excluded from the act were agricultural workers, domestics, healthcare workers, employees of not-for-profit so-called charitable institutions, like the major hospitals and colleges of this land. Well, the act did become law in 1935, and low-wage workers covered by the act formed unions that accepted the trade-off, limited government backing to require employers to bargain, and a system of recognition that divided workers into bargaining units, often pitting small groups of workers against large employers, one of Jake's points. Nevertheless, this reform brought about the transformation of heretofore low-wage factory and transportation jobs into high-wage jobs with benefits, pensions, and security. The most important factor in the growth of the American middle class in the post-World War II era. Although the U.S. labor movement never achieved majority status, the impact on market rates was profound, far beyond the union shops. In Rochester, for example, non-union Eastman Kodak had to compete for production workers with unionized General Motors Delco, General Motors Rochester Products, as well as Xerox, 
These three firms alone accounting for over 15,000 blue-collar union members at their height. The National Labor Relations Act, as originally passed, was very short-lived. It was amended in 1947 by the Taft-Hartley Act, which outlawed many forms of worker protests by union members. It prohibited supervisors from joining unions, heretofore they were able to. It banned communists and those refusing to take a loyalty oath from union office. And it weakened finances by allowing states to ban union shop clauses in collective bargaining agreements, the last being known deceivingly as right to work laws. The 1959 Labor Management Reporting and Disclosure Act further constrained union growth by mandating a whole host of bureaucratic requirements in the operation of unions. Hostile federal courts issued rulings that year after year added to the destruction of unions, inventing the judicial doctrine of the duty of fair representation, deciding a case called Beck versus CWA against the unions, and lately Harris versus Quinn, to name just a few. Harris versus Quinn was the last Supreme Court decision of this session, and it said that home care workers who were so-called consumer directed, in other words, they were designated by the consumer, by the patient, were not really employees. And it took away the rights of a quarter million unionized healthcare workers to have agency fee provisions and crippled the finances of health care unions across the country. The union movement actually breathed a sigh of relief that they only went so far as to deny home care workers the right of a contract with agency fee. Uh, Justice uh, Alioto, or whatever the hell his name is, was actually begging for a case to outlaw agency fee in the entire public sector across the country. Watch for that in the next session. Also watch for another thing I'm a bit concerned about. Uh, in the, uh, the slaughter of the Democrats last Tuesday, it was noted that this is the most Republicans in Congress since the Truman administration. The relevance to our day today is over the President's veto, President Truman's veto, a Republican Congress joined by Southern Democrats passed the Taft-Hartley Act severely crippling unions. Here we go again. I'll get back to the remarks. The union movement, after this, now pushed away from its roots, was not blameless in its own demise. Under conservative leadership, many unions purged their best organizers, leftists of various affiliations, from their ranks in the 1950s and early 1960s. Growth of union membership in the United States slowed and then stopped. The AFL-CIO's membership of 13 million at the time of the merger in 1954 did not change for two and a half decades while the U.S. workforce tripled in size. It's called losing market share in the corporate world. There were moments of revival. Uh, some states passed laws allowing teachers and other government employees to bargain collectively. Dr. King turned from the struggle for civic justice to the struggle for economic justice, but was gunned down while supporting striking sanitation workers in Memphis. Farm workers organized in California and elsewhere in spite of having no legal protections and healthcare workers struck in cities such as New York, San Francisco, and others, forcing Congress to amend the National Labor Relations Act to include them in 1974. By the late 70s, the decline of labor union membership in the private sector, masked by its growth in the public sector, became obvious. Efforts to restore some balance to the National Labor Relations Act failed due to a record six unsuccessful cloture votes. That's the vote that stops the filibuster in the U.S. Senate in 1978. The Carter administration did little to help. Political activists walked away from Carter's re-election, like me. Many supporting Ted Kennedy, and Ronald Reagan was elected president of the United States in 1980. Reagan wasted no time in setting an example for business by crushing one of only two unions to have supported his election bid, the air traffic controllers. Many of us remember that story. Union busting had already become a multi-million dollar industry. Reagan put it on steroids. He appointed a professional union buster from Los Angeles to chair the National Labor Relations Board. He did the same thing with the EPA, with, uh, with a variety of the Civil Rights uh, uh, Bureau. Uh, it was the, uh, the, the uh, coyotes watching the chicken coop. Um, he promoted globalization and its resulting flight of manufacturing jobs overseas. Deregulation of transportation injured transportation workers like the Teamsters as well. The cumulative result of all of these assaults on good union jobs caused the near disappearance 
of industrial unions in the United States, the very unions who built the American middle class, those were the factory unions. By the time the Democrats regained control of the White House, after 12 years of Republican rule, another Southern Democrat, Grand Democrat, Bill Clinton, appointed a commission to study the barriers to worker organizing. The study lasted two years, enough time for the Republicans to seize control of Congress, and then any hope of labor law reform. No serious attempt has been made since then. We get to the 21st century with a radically different workforce that uh, Jim and Vince and uh, Jeff uh, showed us in, in, in very vivid detail about the changes in the workforce in Rochester and across the country. One dominated by services and government employment, many jobs in categories historically and currently excluded from even the weak protections of labor laws. With the underlying cause of wage growth gone, namely healthy unions, working families' incomes have stagnated, Excessive wealth is being accumulated by the 1%. There is record income inequality, poor working conditions, impoverishment of much of the working class, and a government that does little to correct the problem. Sound similar? What was it, deja vu all over again? That's the phrase. Last December, the Rochester Area Community Foundation released a study titled Poverty and the Concentration of Poverty in the Nine-County Greater Rochester Area. It was followed in January by the Women's Foundation of the Genesee Valley Report, Improving Economic Self-Sufficiency for Women and Girls 2014 Update, which used the concept not of the federal poverty level, but of self-sufficiency, the level of income necessary for a family to live in Rochester without public or other outside assistance. Needless to say, these figures, as Barbara has mentioned, are much higher than the indices of poverty. A uh, woman head of household with several children, it hovers around $40,000 to be self-sufficient in the city of Rochester, New York at this point. And we've had some discussion Thursday night about the concept of what is low-wage work, but that's what the Women's Foundation says it takes to raise a family in the city of Rochester without outside assistance. In response to the public hand-wringing that followed uh, the reports, I wrote an opinion piece published by a city newspaper titled The Real Solution to Rochester's Poverty. It began with a quote from Nelson Mandela. President Mandela said, poverty is not an accident. Like slavery and apartheid, it is man-made and can be removed by the actions of human beings. So in the article, I asserted several premises that are true. First, most poor people work. They work every day. They work long hours and often multiple jobs just to make ends meet. Two, the primary cause of poverty, therefore, is not a lack of jobs, nor a lack of skills and education, nor an alleged culture of poverty that renders poor people dysfunctional. It is the fact that the jobs that poor people hold pay low wages. Three, poor people in our community have not been passive victims of their own exploitation. They have repeatedly fought back against the lack of respect, bad working conditions, and low wages. I surveyed the half dozen unions in this area who have local organizers in the field and found that 4,000 4, workers, mostly low wage workers and mostly people of color, in the immediate Rochester area have tried to form unions and been defeated over the last 10 years. Four, the principal reason for these losses is a well-financed, sophisticated reign of terror, there is no other way to describe it, inflicted on these workers by a handful of law firms and consultants hired by employers in this area, each and every time an organizing effort occurs. Many area employers go so far as to engage firms for union avoidance practices. Unity Healthcare. These are sophisticated counterinsurgency programs that include selective hiring, anti-union propaganda, supervisory surveillance techniques, and more. There was a debate among my staff as to whether I should use the phrase deliberately engineered in a sentence in the opening paragraph of my piece that read, as community leaders discuss yet another exhaustive study of our region's poverty and how our city has become one of the poorest in America, a fundamental fact continues to be ignored that much of Rochester's poverty has been quite 
deliberately engineered by employers and a handful of law firms dedicated to crushing collective action by local workers. That's what the paragraph said. Well, Stan said, you know, that might look too angry, might be a little far out to start the piece that way, it's more militant popular rhetoric that can be easily dismissed, I don't know, and, you know, finally I said, all right, enough, I won the debate. I said, you gotta call it out. It became, <laughs> Good staff, by the way, they watch my back. Um, <laughs> so it became deliberately engineered because it is. When the Unity Health System, now the Rochester Regional Health System with 13,000 employees, spends hundreds, hundreds of thousands of dollars to hire the managing partner of the Pittsburgh office of the late nation's largest and leading anti law firm, Jackson Lewis, to keep low wage workers, home care, home health, I'm sorry, nursing home workers to keep them poor and without affordable health insurance, what else do you call it? When Kirkhaven Nursing Home, affiliated with the Presbyterian Church, employs another lawyer consultant to set up focus groups to isolate and psychologically intimidate direct care workers who support unionization last year, what else do you call it? When on the very day of a National Labor Relations Board election at Episcopal Church Home on Mount Hope Avenue, after passing by administration employees wearing bright, no, uh, bright red vote no t-shirts gardening around the front door, which they've never done before. Nice garden. Selected employees were actually diverted to an office to pick up their paychecks and told their TANF-sponsored school benefits might be jeopardized if they chose a union. Now go vote, the manager said. What else do you call it? When the Ark of Monroe spends $400,000 on out-of-town thugs, literally, to beat back an attempt to form a union by several hundred low-wage group home workers and drivers, what else do you call it? When the so-called liberals and most elected officials in this town turn a blind eye when I beg them to intervene and stop the attack on the very lifeblood of our community, low-wage caregivers, what else do you call it? When civil liberties advocates, some from the very law firms who practice these tactics, fail to recognize that when huge numbers of our fellow citizens live in the dictatorship of the workplace, that is the greatest threat to civil liberties. What else do you call it? What else do you call it but deliberately engineered poverty in Rochester, New York? There are dozens of more examples. If you, want, if you think my descriptions are, are exaggerated or that I'm some paranoid lunatic, start reading Marty Levitt's uh, book, Confessions of a Union Buster. It's still at Amazon. It's a bestseller. It's one of the best step-by-step -step exposés of these guys. This is not an accident. Poll after poll shows that low-wage workers want to join union and form unions to better their working conditions and lift themselves out of poverty if only they had a free choice. So on the question before us today, ways to lift low-wage workers out of poverty. You asked me to talk about organizing low-wage workers. We first need to find a strategy to deal with the enemy. Are there ways to neutralize the union busters? To date, our efforts at dislodging these parasites, once they are in place, has had very little success. Political and community pressure, a call for fair play and conscience have, leal, have yielded little in the way of results. When United Farm Worker organizers were being shot for trespass in the fields, Cesar Chavez shifted the organizing to the barrio, where the workers lived. When the members of the Memphis local of the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees, AFSCME, walked off the job in 1968 in Memphis, Tennessee, they made it a civil rights struggle in the community. If we can't win in the workplace because of the boss's superior power and access to the workers, then we need to turn to a community-based approach. This strategy implies a very different use of organizer and union officials' time. It means aligning the interests of low-wage workers with churches and community-based organizations. It suggests a major publicity and educational campaign, Jake, that you referred to. It also suggests a different model of union membership. The union movement must reinvent itself, and it must do it now. Too few unions devote any resources to organizing low-wage workers. But in many very decent democratic locals in our area are locked in the increasingly difficult battle just to keep their jobs 
and their hard-won benefits. I mean, you can tick off, you know, Franny with the Xerox numbers, the auto plants closed. I, CWA's got 400 members at Frontier. I remember when, when Roger Tatel had 1,700 CWA members. I mean, just, the list goes on and on, but I gotta tell you, we can't win on defense. If union organizing in some form is the only solution to fighting poverty on a mass scale, and I sincerely believe it is, then we have to change the way we do business. We need to redeploy our financial resources and staff to reach out to low-wage workers in the community. By we, I mean the unions. We need to develop and strengthen alliances with other progressive organizations and causes. We need to make worker rights a core principle in civil liberties. I'll digress a minute on that. <clears throat> uh, I'm a member of the board of the New York Civil Liberties Union. Uh, I came to their attention because of the labor movement support to stop the arrest of Occupy Rochester and negotiating the deal for Washington Square Park occupation. Um, our work plan and the work plan of the National ACLU contains every possible right you have ever imagined or heard of except workers' rights. And one of the these reasons I'm there is I intend to change that because that's foolish and it's absurd. That's why I mention that. Um, the Gamilio Foundation has a rule for its faith-based community organizing chapters when tackling an issue. First, it must be broadly felt, and that's one of the roles of this hearing, to create a record and to bring out information, stories, uh, the truth. Uh, it must be clearly defined, and it must be winnable. Right? Broadly felt, clearly defined, winnable. It is our challenge to come up with such issues and strategies. The Rochester Labor Council has endorsed the Fight for 15 as one such strategy. We must find more. We must bust out of a 1935 collective bargaining box that we live in and stop pitting small groups of workers against increasingly more powerful large employers. We need to unite large, work, large numbers of workers in sectors where we can win. Uh, Jake mentioned about unions directed to winning votes and having huge difficulty about getting a first contract. So we at 1199 must be crazy. So the workers at the Unity Living Center, the old St. Mary's Hospital, came to us and said, we desperately need a union. Yeah, they sure did. And some of you heard some of Michelle's stories this morning. It's, it's worse, and that place has got money. I mean, her place is just run by a profiteer. Uh, it's the Unity, you know, whole Unity Health System. Okay. We know they had Jackson Lewis there. So these workers go through a vicious anti-union campaign. They win by six votes. Our organizers had the no vote right on the money they scared the hell out of the yes votes that didn't come out. So we went by six. So we're now pitting 130 workers against 5,000 non-union. They merge in the meantime. It takes 15 months to a first contract, beating back a decertification effort sponsored to throw out the union by the boss, and these workers made it. But that contract that I personally negotiated and led the negotiations, a year of my life, changed not a single economic term for those workers. Now, they're proud of it, and they ought to be. They beat the odds. They got a contract with rights and good contract language and some of the stuff that Michelle talked about. They'll be able to fight for better patient care there, and they'll have a voice in the job, and they won't get pushed around. That's not nothing. But we're talking about how do we solve poverty and how do we change the society, and it's not one bargaining unit at a time. I mean, we keep doing that, you know. I mean, I'm not going to live long enough anyways, but Jake's not going to live long enough either to see that, and he's a hell of a lot younger than me. Um, so, there are places where collective bargaining still works that we can hold up to other workers, but it's when we engage, enough workers engage management. For example, uh, 1,700 service workers at the University of Rochester present a good local example. They recently won a $15 minimum wage for every worker with five years of service in the third year of their contract, March 2017. It's a start. Right? We adopted the Fight for 15 in a bargaining, as did the service workers in Johns Hopkins, and we went to, uh, to 15 bucks in the third year. Yeah. They kept their free comprehensive health insurance, 
they continue child care support and educational benefits, and they get paid to go to class. In 2007, when we calculated the barely value, am I out of time? Well, so. All right, I'm, I'm down to one more page. <clears throat> Um, in 2007, we did an exercise. We calculated the value of just the difference in those workers' wages and what they saved by having a free comprehensive health care insurance. And we, we, uh, we, we have good computer programs, and we plotted that we had a little over, between our local and Local 200 that represents the campus side, we found that we had just over 500 households in the southwest neighborhoods, 146080, 10, and 14619. And the difference between the market rate for those jobs and what other U of R employees paid for health insurance was $8 million. When Bob Duffy got elected, I said, will you be interested in like a program that puts like seven, eight million bucks in private sector money into the 19th ward in the surrounding neighborhoods and it doesn't cost you a penny? Yeah, I guess so. How'd you do that? Help us unionize more workers. You know, stop what happened in Episcopal Church Home on Mount Hope Avenue. There's another 250. There were 75 uh, people in that uh, group that lived in those uh, zip, zip codes, right? Um, by 2014, that figure is much higher. I would say it's at least 10, 11 million in differential, maybe more because of the collapse of wages at the other hospital. The U of R service workers also know that they have rights and can speak out, but these workers are the exception, not the rule in Rochester. So the stakes are very high. The very fabric of the society that we live in. But what better reason to walk the earth than to fight for what we know is right? In conclusion, his book, David K. Johnston, uh, his most recent book is a collection of essays called Divided, The Perils of Our Growing Inequality. Uh, he starts with a chapter filled with quotes from notable people. Here are three of my favorites. Wherever there is great poverty, there is great inequality. For one very rich man, there must be at least 500 poor, and the affluence of the few supposes the indigence <coughs> of the many. Uh, that was the right-wing godhead Adam Smith in the notable book, The Wealth of the Nations. Um, next, the distribution of wealth is not determined by nature, it is determined by policy. Our recently re-elected Attorney General, Eric Schneiderman, said that. And finally, a quote attributed to Plutarch, the ancient Greek historian. An imbalance between rich and poor is the oldest and most fatal ailment of all republics. So thank you for coming out on a Saturday. This is a beginning, not an end. There are a number of initiatives going on. This is one of them. Metro Justice Fight for 15, which you've heard about, is another. The Rochester Alliance of, Trans of Communities Transforming Society, Rochester Acts, is another. That's a clergy-based organization. People Organizing for Worker Empowerment and Respect is a worker center initiative that Luis is going to talk about. Uh, the Metro Justice Elder Justice Task Force, because so many of these workers are low-wage healthcare workers. It's an important new formation. The organizing of adjunct college faculty that we've heard about today, and the organizing of other low-wage workers, including those by the Rochester Building Trades who are trying to desperately racially integrate the building trades through affirmative action and hiring and apprenticeship programs. And the uh, efforts of, uh, weak efforts of my own union as well. So we'll figure this out, we'll get through it somehow. Um, but. That is my perspective on it. Um, I cited some studies and some stuff. There are extra copies up here, including the Community Foundation Study on Poverty, the Rochester, uh, I'm sorry, the, the Women's Foundation of Genesee Valley, the AFLCL Resolution Supporting Fight for 15, and some copies of my stuff. Thank you. I, I enjoy the fact of what you said and mentioned as part of the first strategy, recognizing and dealing with ways to lift the uh, low wage burden. But I want you to unpack that more with the issue of finding a strategy to deal with the enemy. I want to unpack that. Okay. And and then who is who who are the enemies? So that and I'm sure right. I'm sure as part as you being a union official and just meeting with other union officials that this 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 has been a meeting 
of the mind that you all probably have had to try to figure out how do we in fact or how do you deal with the enemy and be in front of them rather than they be in front of you? Um, I, I think that one of the conclusions of Reverend Washington, I think, is that we need to move the organizing away from the work site. Or not. Um. Okay. I, I think the answer is, we, we, one of the answers is I think we need to move the organizing away from the work site. Um, the workers at Jordan House Center organized um, in the, well it took them three years, so it was a, two elections, et cetera, et cetera. They organized in the late 70s, early 80s. And when we were in there, after an immensely pitched battle for a first contract, uh, mind you, this is a not-for-profit community-based institution, shares a tremendous number of the same values that my local does, you know, access to health care, poor people, services, everything else. Um, so some years passed, and one day I was called into the office of the CEO, and he said to me, Bruce, uh, I've watched you for a while, and I've watched this union, and you know, you guys ain't so bad. And I said, um, okay. He said, I just want you to know, I know you get my financial reports, and I want you to know that last year, um, not all of our legal fees reported in our disclosure went, to, went to, against the union. And I said, Tim, uh, it's about 65000 This was back in about 81. I said, just how much did you spend? He said, well, about $1,500 and $1,981 per work. Uh, he said, now let me tell you what goes on. So the corporate law firm for Jordan Health Center is Harder Seacrest. And when the union first came, and I said, wait a minute, the workers came to us. Let's not get this business about the union came and took your workers. Okay, he says. Um, my first call was to my lawyers. And my lawyers said, oh, we're going to save you from 1199 if only you pay us hourly bills. And they marketed to me, the CEO, that you were the greatest threat to my ability to, to operate and therefore serve poor people. And, but we're going to save you hundreds of thousands of dollars later, right? And at this year, 50-something in the year. It went on for years, by the way. Um, and so there is a culture in management that you can't run the operation if there's a union. And the consultants and the busters, and that's Harder Seacrest, uh, it is um, Harris Beach, it is uh, my reference to civil liberty. You know, we've got some people on these law firms that are civil libertarians, right? I go to them and say, guys, go down the hallway and just stop what this guy's doing, right? But there is this culture of management that says, I'm on a mission, particularly the not-for-profits are some of the worst. I'm on this mission, and we have a union, I can't run the place, and oh my god, and I can't make ends meet already, and I, I pay the workers more if I could, but that kind of stuff. And the lawyers walk in and say, we'll save you from that, and they just literally terrorize the workers. And I think that there's some decent bosses, administrators, that uh, look, both look the other way, but also say, well, you know, it's what I got to do. Of course, then they go home to Pittsford with their, you know, three-digit salary. You know, these nursing home operators make between 100 and 300 k. Those are the not-for-profit CEOs, and so they got theirs, and it goes on. So I think, you know, what we have to do then is um, do what uh, you know. Jake's talking about a different model. I'm talking about a different model. I think this is a community issue. I mean, poverty is killing everybody, and I also think that. Um, I don't think there's any solution to the crisis in the city school district, to drugs and crime. I mean, there's some folks that make a hell of a lot more from drugs, but we know from the uh, Freakonomics book, uh, the chapter, Why Do Crack Dealers Live With Their Mothers? Because the pyramid scream and stream is if there was a decent paying job out there, they wouldn't be dealing crack because it doesn't pay much in the bottom. So those are all thoughts on that. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Jeff Nizanski. I'm an attorney with Legal Assistance of Western New York and Rochester. I spoke in session one about forms of worker exploitation, and you have heard from low-wage workers about the challenges of surviving on the edge of financial ruin in session two this morning. We are here this afternoon to, dis to discuss what can be done about this. The status quo in our community is unacceptable. 46% of our city's children are impoverished, more than double the national rate. Sixty years after the U.S. Supreme Court's landmark Brown v. Board of Education decision, 
We live in a community highly segregated by race and class, and in a county containing both the best performing school district in the state and the worst performing school district in the state of New York. The contrasts could hardly be more stark. Rochester's poverty can be attributed to more to stubbornly low wages, exacerbated by the loss of good paying manufacturing jobs like the one I had at General Motors, than to high unemployment. In fact, Rochester's unemployment rate of 5.9% in August was lower, lower than the New York State rate of 6.4% and the national average of 6.1%. We are here today to present strategies to lift workers out of poverty. Before doing so, it's useful to note that tax breaks as a strategy have not worked. The Mercatus Center at George Mason University recently reported that New York State has five times more tax breaks than any other state, with almost 72,000 tax subsidy deals worth $21 billion. If tax breaks was the answer, we'd be the richest state in the nation with no poverty. The core problem is that wages have been stubbornly stagnant for years. Economist Jared Bernstein reported that, quote, absent more individual and collective bargaining power, for the vast majority of workers who lack it, some of whom have college degrees, will be hard pressed to turn these wage trends around. Such power is not the only determinant of wages, but it may well be the most important and the one most sorely lacking. I'm here today to speak about developing a worker center here in Rochester as a way to lift workers up, combat wage theft, and other forms of worker exploitation. Many government agencies charged with enforcing work rules are underfunded and understaffed. Labor laws designed to protect worker rights are instead used to undermine collective bargaining, as Bruce so eloquently discussed, and Jake. Uh, corporations like Walmart continue to take advantage of weak U.S. labor laws and inadequate labor law enforcement that fall far short of international standards. With only 5.8% of Rochester's private sector labor force unionized, the remaining unrepresented private sector workers have limited knowledge of their workplace rights. I've seen that time and time again on my job. Aside from existing unions, there are no local organizations dedicated to supporting workers with workplace problems and with training about asserting workplace rights. It's time we use other approaches. Among the more promising approaches are worker centers, which have grown from five centers in 1992 to 139 by 2005, uh, located in over 80 U.S. communities across 32 states, and now the number is up to about 200. Worker centers are defined as community-based and community-led organizations that engage in a combination of service, advocacy, and organizing to provide support to low-wage workers. Worker centers are not unions and do not seek legal recognition to engage in collective bargaining. The primary tasks of worker centers are training workers in exercising their legal right to concerted action, developing leaders among these workers, and in providing strong community support for these efforts. Locally, a worker center can help alleviate Rochester's poverty by helping low-wage workers improve their wages. Representatives from 10 organizations have recently formed a worker center here in Rochester, known as People Organizing for Worker Empowerment and Respect, or by its acronym, POWER. Our goals include, one, building trust and relationships among low-wage workers, two, educating and training worker leaders on their rights at work and how to organize collectively, three, building capacity and membership in our organization, and four, increasing public awareness about the importance of improving conditions for low-wage workers. Through partnerships with community groups and with individual outreach, we aim to create public awareness and community dialogue about workers' needs. We seek to focus this dialogue on making Rochester a high road community with increased worker empowerment as a way to reduce poverty. We plan to hold monthly forums of workers from different economic sectors to collectively identify challenges and opportunities that they face. Central to our plans is a continuation of our Women's Committee, which recognizes and seeks to address the needs of women workers. As a democratic organization, 
Workers will decide what campaigns to pursue. There are three successful models that we can replicate here in Rochester that are worth considering, in my opinion. The Tompkins County Worker Center in Ithaca, New York, has 88 certified living wage employers. The living wage in Tompkins County was determined to be $12.62 an hour with health insurance and $13.94 an hour without health insurance. The appeal of this approach is that no legislation is required. Employers voluntarily seek to be certified as a living wage employer and receive favorable publicity and the increased business that results from being a high road employer. Living wage employers show integrity and leadership in the community and create a positive image in the minds of current and potential customers. Living wage employers strengthen relationships between staff and management, raise employee morale and productivity, and encourage employee loyalty. If Ithaca, with a population of just over 30,000 people, can achieve 88 living wage employers covering almost 3,000 employees, how many living wage employers can we find in Rochester, a city of 210,000 people? Our challenge is to find out. Importantly, Rochester adopted a living wage ordinance in 2001 by a unanimous vote of uh, the city council with the support of the mayor. It set minimum wage rates for employees of companies entering into contracts for services with the city of Rochester and applies to contracts of worth $50,000 or more. City council passed this law to encourage employers to pay living wages in this community. The living wage rate is adjusted annually to keep up with inflation. The rate through June 2014 is $11.47 an hour for employees offered health insurance benefits and $12.81 an hour for those not offered these benefits. Expansion of this ordinance to include more workers could be a viable goal. We must address our wide local economic disparity if our community is to thrive. From 2006 to 2010, African Americans in Rochester spent 51% of their income on rent, over half of their income on rent, and Hispanics, 55%. The median household income for African Americans in the region was 52% that of white households. Another worker center model that we could pursue is that of the Los Angeles Black Worker Center. Their mission is to increase access to quality jobs, reduce employment discrimination, promote economic and racial justice, and reduce inferior jobs in the black community. The Los Angeles Black Worker Center partners with organizations, advocates, and industry leaders that have valuable information and opportunities for black workers. Worker Center members gain access to job resources and training. Still another model we could adopt is from Vermont's Worker Center. And I think one of those members is in the room right now from that Worker Center I've heard. Uh, there's their Put People First campaign organizes from the right to dignified work, affordable child care, education, housing, health care, healthy food, and a healthy environment. We've also seen how Worker Center and unions came together in New York City to pass a local law granting paid sick days. Effective April 1, 2014, that law requires businesses with 20 or more employees to provide up to five paid sick days for those workers. The United States, unlike many countries, does not compare very well in the, in the realm of sick pay. Uh, in our city of poverty wages, we must use innovative high road approaches that fairly reward work. By doing so, we can discourage low road employers that subsidize their businesses at public expense, paying wages so low that their workers qualify for food stamps and Medicaid. We should heed the words of President Franklin D. Roosevelt, who in 1933 said, and I quote, throughout industry, the change from starvation wages and starvation employment to living wages and sustained employment can, in large part, be made by an industrial covenant to which all employers subscribe. A worker center is an important step towards lift lifting workers out of poverty into a more prosperous Rochester. Thank you. No, I'm saying to John. I always have a question. Jeff, I have a question for you about the uh, living wage employers. You, were, you challenged us uh, to find out how many living wage employers we have here in Rochester. What will happen to that information 
if it is determined that we do in fact have living wage employers? Well, what we could do is what uh, the Tompkins County Worker Center does. They maintain a list of living wage employers on their website, and they uh, publicize this information and encourage people to patronize these businesses, and they agree to pay a living wage. So I think uh, we could do the same thing here if we put our mind to it. I think that's an important aspect because we've talked a lot about punishing, but I think sometimes rewarding works equally as effectively, and mm -hmm. so I'm glad to hear that there's some thinking about supporting some kind of public campaign to acknowledge the few, probably, but their attempts. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Sure. I'd like to um, further that. I want to further what Barbara shared because I, I think, and I was particularly looking at the uh, Compton County Worker Center. I thought that was interesting. And we have a group that's called Rochester Business Alliance. And they are the hub of over 3,000 members from the largest employer dealing with U of R down to the mom and pop stores. Has that concept been talked about in terms of the workers, just the you know, worker centers, perhaps even mimicking something like that with relative to the certified uh, certified um, living wage employers? Well, I, I can tell you that there's been contemplation of how this would appeal to businesses in the sense that there are a lot of businesses that want to do the right thing by their, worker, by, you know, by their workers and pay a decent wage, but they're being undercut by low road employers that are uh, not paying a decent wage and maybe stealing wages, that kind of thing, like we heard this morning about not paying for all the hours worked, that kind of thing. So to the extent that employers, and many employers, uh, it seems to me, want to, to uh, have the esteem of the community and, and the, the goodwill that goes with that, because when you value a business, accountants put a value on the goodwill of a company, and it's a lot of money. For example, if, if that company's got a goodwill, and especially the, those that are uh, consumer products and, and that have um, uh, a market that you and I can patronize, but even those that are not still need uh, good publicity to, to thrive. So I think there is an opportunity in that regard to. I think that one of the, the prominent things that I saw that really worked, and, and Jake alluded to it, was when they, with the uh, uh, Metro Justice, with the worker, with the Fight for 15 at Each Ridge, Wendy, and how the community came out in strong numbers to support just 10 people. And the whole store was impacted by that. But it was the community that was there. And so perhaps looking at what you're saying, in support of what you're saying, but also looking at the, the various different model, you know, particularly looking at with the Tompkin County Worker Center how they did it with their certified, um, certified uh, living, wage camp. living wage employers, that we too can do something like that, um, given the fact with the, with, the, with the understanding that we have a community that's backing that, right. and, and giving honorable mention to those businesses and whatever else in terms of incentive to those businesses that we, we can do. Have there been any further discussions you know, concerning that? Well, there's been talk about a number of different way, strategies. For example, um, opening up labor union membership in this community to anybody who wants to be a member, mm -hmm. having associate memberships, uh, broadening the base of, of people in the community that uh, um, would you know, support this kind of concept. I think there's a lot of different uh, ideas that can be uh, pursued in that regard. Make a suggestion because I saw Louise. I won't use it. I saw Louise raising his hand because he wants to answer your question, but he's going to make a presentation. So why not you do that and then we can combine more questions right. for you and Jeff. Happy with me, but I'm going to cut half of my presentation because 
is what people have said already. In media, they tell you you have to say things three times for people to get it. It's been done. I don't need to say it again. Um, but something I want to say is thank you. Thank you for the invitation to speak today to the Rochester Level Council. Um, I accepted this invitation with a little bit of hesitation. You know, I'm a new organizer for uh, power, people organizing for worker empowerment and respect. But I also know the importance of having this dialogue because it will be necessary for the stand, for the traditional institution, progressive institutions to engage in this conversation for us to really move into some of the options that have been provided this morning. And that's what my hope is today we start this discussion is that we move that way. I'll just share with you my own frustrations with the things that have been mentioned today as a personal perspective. And my dad always said, if you're going to make mistakes, make new ones, don't make the same ones that I made. <laughs> so my hope is that I can prevent some other people from doing the mistakes that I've done. And you can just keep and go and do some new stuff and then teach me. And the NLRB. Uh, I remember running the boycott of the Rochester Plaza and having to have this discussion with the lawyers about what language we could have in the signs. So we would have like these big yellow signs where we talk about workers' <laughs> rights, the right to be able to organize without being this, <coughs> without attacks from the management. But that was like this big because most of the signs had to be covered by legal leads. On like, this is not a union drive, this is like, this is not a tent. So it was amazing trying to do a new organizing process through the National Labor Relations Act and like having this discussion with our own lawyers on how to like we do that and trying to play within the rules of this national labor. So that's one frustration. The second fr uh, frustration that has been raised already, the le other legal process that are available for workers who are trying to enforce their rights, they don't allow for community and movement building. If you try, like, I don't know if you guys have ever tried to do a community organizing campaign by supporting what's happening inside a courtroom, it's impossible. Once you decide, as a worker decides to, I'm going to do this through the legal means, what does the lawyer say? Don't talk to anybody. If you are successful, after maybe a year, five years, ten years, what is the lawyer going to say? You need to sign this agreement saying that you're not going to be able to talk about this statement. Exactly, thank you. And let me tell you, if you try to talk about legalese with a bullhorn in front of a court case, courtroom, it doesn't work either. You know, those are just things that I try to do, they don't work. The last thing that came up is the time frame of our organizing campaign. You know, if you're an organizer and you're driven by this idea of an election, you know, and you're working really hard, you know, the date is coming, whatever happens, you have to move to the next campaign, to the next target. And any chances is very challenging. Those relationships that have been happening as you're trying to argue against the boss, how do you maintain that when people are kind of moving out and then with another mentality? So those are the three, three frustrations that I just, I just thought about when we were talking about this stuff. And so I just skip, I'm gonna skip all this. <laughs> I skip this, so I'll go straight to. In their paper, Worker Centers Organizing Communities in the Edge of Dream, Janice Fine explains that worker centers are community-based organizations engaging in service, advocacy, and organizing in support of low-wage workers. And that's what is important with this. Is for me, when I have to, now I've been trying to explain worker centers. You know, I've been working this for a month. I gotta get my elevator speech. How do you explain a worker center? For me, it's three components. I explained a third of it is having a church component into it, which is where people ha build trust and we're able to talk about not what is legal, but what is right. There's a component about testimony. 
That is the idea that people speak from their own experience. And they do that to challenge the isolating process that it is to work, advocate for your own rights. And say, like, no, I'm going to tell my story for the sakes of other people to be able to learn from my story and for me to learn how, for, as a community process, how are we going to address my story to come up with a victory. And third is that organizing component. It's where we come together as a community to take, react to those campaigns, to those stories, of those infrictions of rights of workers in their sites, and we, do, we move it away from the work site into our communities, into our dialogue with community. And as is mentioned already, this is nothing new. It happens throughout the, our nation. It's new ways. It's done in different ways. And as we see, it's going to be just, and it's going to catch up here somewhere. So how would this work? in my mentality, right? And you kind of like, sometimes I say like, I organize plans, so I know the one thing that is not going to happen because things are always going to change away from your plans. But this would be the same idea that I ha I'm trying to enforce in a worker center. On November 17, we're going to be meeting at the, one of the Methodist churches in the area. We're going to talk for 20, 25 minutes about wage theft. It's not gonna, even though we'll probably have two lawyers there, it's not gonna be about wage theft from the legal component, but about how it makes economic sense for an employer to invest in taking away wages from people, because what happens in the worst of situations, it may be referred to the Department of Labor, a, the Department of Labor agrees with that, and they refer to the Attorney General. And if it's not going to have any big political uh, gains for the Attorney General, it's not going to be enforced. So it's a good, you know, if you are going for the capitalist system, it makes sense. You know, that's not what a lawyer would say. That's what I, we would talk about in, in this kind of space. Then we'll have somebody speak about it from their own experience about wage theft, like their experience, and then as, as a community, we're going to start dealing about how do we do the first step? What is, should be the first step look like? What should we be doing as a community to not only have that person deal with this alone, but in a community sense? And my hope is that through this, we're not only addressing the small fires that take place, but we're really building trust that we can come together and really come back. And those people who do have victories and have failures can bring them back to our community and they feel trust enough that they can engage each other in developing this kind of dialogue. And what will need for that to happen? It may, it's not going to be only about what happens at those church basements and things like that. It's going to need the requirement of a lot of the advocates to change their mentality, you know? This idea of like picking up the phone as an organizer and saying like, oh, you know, I gotta go run and organize this site because I just got this call because I think it's a hot shop and you know, like, we need to kind of say like, well, let's wait for a second and maybe you need to kind of like come and help build the worker center and help build that kind of consciousness and that will give us a better space in a year, two years to get this done. I don't know if that's possible. You know, like, I don't know if I would come to my boss when I was an organizer and say, like, yeah, let, let me just refer them to these crazy people who do in the worker center. And it's like, nah, that's not, doesn't work sense. It also is going to have to change the mentality of a lot of our people who do that um, legal services. You know, in terms of saying, like, let me, do I, do I, can we have enough of a trust? Where I can give you both options. One is the option, the traditional option of the isolating legal process where you may be able to get your money, but at the end of the day, that's not gonna be that's not gonna bill for the next worker because you know the employer made an investment 
for the sake of being able to do that again at the next generation? Or are people in the legal community going to be feel trust enough to say, like, no, let's work through this process, where, you know, it's going to be hard, it, but you're going to be in the driving seat. It's not going to be me driving you through some legalese maze, but it's you understanding your campaign, understanding your call. And there, I'm sure there'll be more challenges. But as, as I mentioned before, you know, I already, I've been hitting my head in the other places, so I'm ready to at least start knocking on wood on this one. <laughs> Thank you. Since you're up there, I'm going to skip to this, this question that I was going to address to Bruce, and I'm going to get Bruce. I would like to have Bruce to have an opportunity to respond to it too. The idea of you know a different format than unions, and one of the things that um, I'm curious about is the use of um, public funds like Kickstarter and so on and so forth. The use of social media. I was amazed to find out that there's a because I'm of that generation a. Uh, a website that gives you the salaries of things is called Glassdoor, where you can find out what other people doing your job are being paid. How are we going to incorporate those into the work that you're doing with the, the um, with power and also working with the unions? How are you going to incorporate the new media, the new way of communicating, rather than having people who work three jobs have to come to a center to hit, get education? So I think actually there's three questions there I want to Probably. answer. Probably. Uh, one is about fundraising, kickstart, that kind of new technology. I think that that is very important, but at the end of the day, the discussion needs to be about a membership-run process. Okay. And so, you know, it's, it's part of that is that you know, and you know, the challenge of like doing grant writing and those, and that that dictates where you're going. So from the get-go, it's about how do we engage anybody who walks into the door on this idea, on this responsibility that for you to own this, you need to have invested in it. Second, technology like Glassdoor, I would not even, I would even extend it bigger than that, where we need to get better at understanding. We should be, we should need. The same way that somebody would do the research to invest in a company, we should do the same research when we are approaching a company for bring them back into the community. Uh, that needs to be part of the discussion when, uh, when we're not only talking, so for example, we need to know basic ideas like who's the ownership, uh, public, private, blah, 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 like where are all the components in terms of who is in the board and those components. So that's, that's important for us to have that conversation and not, not, not to think that that's a conversation that happens higher up, but happens around the table when we're talking about our own experiences. And the third one I forgot, so I... Well, you know, one of the things that I noticed working with, I've had a, a situation where I've had some interaction with community health aides in this past week. They all use the phone, okay? So they may not have computers, but they're all using their phone. And it seems to me that that's an opportunity for all of the people that are working on this to make things more mobile. Yeah. Because when you have three jobs and kids, there's not a lot of time to go to a meeting. Yeah. That, no, that, there's that component. There's a component of how do we invest the infrastructure that we have to reach out and connect with people. Right. Um, I can speak about that in, in, in another angle, but some other time. Um, but. Is, is that component, you know, like also being able to do the direct connection one to one uh, with actions and things like that? I have one more question, John, and then I promise I'll stop. It, it has to do with um, indexing the, and, and I'm, I absolutely support the fight for 15, so don't get me wrong on this, mm -hmm. but you know, historically, the minimum wage or the lower wage workers were indexed to the manufacturing jobs. You know, it used to be 50% of the manufacturing jobs was considered. That's where you start, your low wage workers start. I think I read that at some place. And now it's down to about 30% of a manufacturing job, except we don't have manufacturing jobs anymore. So my question has to do with what kind of indexes are people looking at 
to, 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 you know, to be able to do this in, in sort of an objective way, okay? If you have an average manufacturing job, you take 50% of that, and certain kinds of jobs need to meet that minimum amount, okay? Now it's down to 30%, you know, soon we'll be at 15%. It seems to me we need another index. So what might some of those be? And that may not be a question for you, Luis, I'll leave that maybe one to for Bruce. somebody else, so. Yeah, in terms of, of the, I think that, yeah, I'll leave it to Bruce. <laughs> but, I, 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 you know, like they train you, and that's a great question. But I'm going to answer a different question that I want to answer just because, yeah, because I have a chance right now. <laughs> Part of like the five for fifteen and that language is about providing a clear structure for us to be able to talk about living wage, uh, you know, and then having that structure and then dragging other organizations that we know could be good allies into it, you know. And for example, on um, there's a blog that I'll, I'll, I'll blame Jake for this, but on November 20th, I called Gate Divinity School, and the 515 is having that same structure for a lot of the faith communities. Right. So, you know, if, for people who are here who want to bring their ministers by the color, uh, you, you can do that at 8.30 at Colgate Divinity School on November 20th. And thank you for using faith communities, because when you keep saying churches, you exclude temples and synagogues and singas and and atheists and you know a whole bunch of other people. I think we need to find a better word besides churches, please. Yeah, or just a couple on the. Um, I want to comment about the living wage. So John is also the, uh, oh, in the education committee. John and the education committee have a series called the Labor Lyceum. And a year ago, May, the Labor Lyceum invited Pete Myers from the Tompkins County uh, Worker Center, among other people, uh, because we were considering uh, putting workers on together in Rochester. And I wasn't sold on it. Uh, and I wasn't sold on it because I'm not interested in helping people. I'm interested in giving power so people can help themselves. And so I asked Pete in the Q&A piece, do you have a membership base? And he said, yes, we have a 1,000 dues-paying members in Tompkins County. Whenever we help somebody, we sign them up, and they pay uh, the equivalent of one hour's pay for the year to be on this base. Uh, that gives the worker center the ability to mobilize people, to register to vote, to participate and communicate. You've got a network. Uh, so living wage campaigns are very good when they are covered with organizing. Houston, Texas, Justice for Janitors, living wage campaign, subcontracted janitors, resulted in power, right? Rochester, New York, our living wage campaign, the Labor Council worked on that. Parking attendants, various vendors, other people who are city contractors got an increase, it was worthless. Why? We don't know who those workers are. We don't communicate with them. There's no power base. We have no voter base to defend that when the right attacks that law and says it costs the city too much. So there is a big difference between living wage campaigns and living wage campaigns. Living wage campaigns are about organizing the workers, not about getting business to do the right thing. And there's a really important distinction as we move forward. I'm convinced our workers' center understands the difference, and it, it's what sold me. I'm on that steering committee with, with Jeff and Luis and, and, and others, because I think that's another form of the alternative organization. On the techie stuff, um, one thing I do is I do a lot of emails, as some of you know. <laughs> Um, and I'm an old, I'm an old style guy. I said the email stuff they used to do communications. Uh, on the social media stuff, I have younger staff. I say, here, put this out in your stuff, right? That's how I deal with that stuff because I'm not a Facebook person. I'm too paranoid. Uh, but we do have stuff. For example, during the strong hospital negotiations, and during this election, you know, we have a text, a bulk text message service. So uh, my members were getting uh, reports after every bargaining session on 30644. They text strong, they're on the list. Now we have to, because some, a lot of poor workers um, get these plans where, you know, they get, they get, they have to pay for message stuff, so right. the data service stuff. So they have to opt into it. We can't just put them on when we have a cell phone number. Um, the initial funding for the worker center came from two sources, our initial uh, pocket of money. We did do crowdfunding through, it wasn't Kickstarter, it was the other one, but uh, was it Andy, Andy something? Indiegogo. Indiegogo. We topped just, just more than 5,000 
dollars, that's seed money, and we got a small grant from the Wegman Foundation, not Robert, but John, that's another story. But we have some people on a small foundation called the John Wegman Foundation. It, it has a bequest that says a certain amount of money has to go to labor projects every year. The guy was probably delusional when he died, but that's good. <laughs> um, so we combined, we combined a small community foundation grant where we have labor representatives, including John. Uh, John's on that seat. This is a very small town, you know, it's very incestuous. <coughs> okay. Um, so uh, to address that, uh, that piece of it, but it is important that we keep our eye on organizing workers to participate communication leadership development, that leads to real change that can be defended. If we're just making certain behavioral changes on the other side, it, it, it's not defendable. It doesn't develop a, a base of either organizing, electoral, or mobilizing. I'd just like to add to that, um, that as far as the communications piece goes, I think it's crucial that we talk uh, amongst not just um, within our usual silos that we reach out throughout this community to find our allies because they're out there. We're all here, we all know people. We can organize even more. Uh, and this is a great first step. I, I'm so glad that we're here today talking about this. But one of the other things I wanted to mention was how a worker center differs. And one, one of the philosophy, uh, one of its philosophical differences is that rather than just uh, hook a, a, a worker with a grievance with an attorney to then hand the problem to the attorney and let the attorney resolve it, that we teach, we help to teach and show workers how by collectively coming together, they can empower themselves so that they can uh, uh, collectively you know, have power in the workplace. And then a bunch of piece about what do we index uh, our wages to? I, mean, I wouldn't mind indexing them to the uh, CEO wages. I wouldn't either, but I just think that's something that needs to be explored. Uh, let me just correct Bruce on, on one thing. John F. Wegman was not delusional. He was an enlightened small capitalist. Uh, this was back in the days when Wegman was not where he is today. But in the, uh, when he set up his foundation and his will, he stipulated that uh, organized labor was one of the uh, five uh, constituent members of the board. And the first board included the then president of the Rochester Labor Council, who was the head of the Teamsters, who had just led Rochester's general strike. So, you know, not all capitalists are equal. Um, we have some questions on, on white uh, cards, and if anybody hasn't filled out a white card, uh, you still have a few minutes to do that. Uh, but I have a couple of questions here, and one doesn't say who, but it looks like it should go to Bruce. Can pressure be placed on churches who have relationships to institutions such as Kirk Haven and the Episcopal <coughs> Home not to engage uh, anti-union uh, activity? Lord knows I've tried. Uh, <laughs> I, yeah, I, I, I think the short answer is if you've got a way to do it, I mean, look at the Episcopal thing was a good example. Um, I knew a bunch of people on the board, and Jackson Lewis is the attorney. They were about a week ahead of me on everybody. So I started calling around saying, you're on a board, the workers are trying to organize, we want a fair election. The attorney has a meeting with them, and he does what I call the fiduciary shuffle, which is, by the way, wrong, but he says, you have a fiduciary, personal fiduciary responsibility to this corporation. If you talk to Popper, you may put yourself at personal financial risk because you're, you're hurting the interests of the corporation. Therefore, don't take this phone call. So immediately, the bishop wouldn't talk to me. Uh, there were a couple of priests that said, we'll try to set up a meeting, but that was out. Um, a leading physician who I've worked with on a bunch of community stuff wouldn't talk to me. Uh, a, a U of R professor, an MCC, you, you name it. I mean, the board had a number of, of, of leading people, and a good friend of mine who was on city council, he did make the calls, and he found out about this meeting. So this is the kind of thing, and only an exceptional person. Now, there is one that, that we, uh, one of our um, local elected officials was told that uh, last year, and he told him to go you know, where, but he was a lawyer. Right? He said, I don't believe that stuff. Right? But it's still going on today. I mean, this, this was a conversation I had in December. 
and not to restrict it to churches. I think last year with the fight at the JCC over organizing, the same issues happened. Okay. I think that th we also need to educate our own clergy and our own faith leaders in, in these discussions. You know, like I was talking to a worker and said, like, well, you know, there may be a point where you may need to ask your head of your faith tradition to go with you on as a step of escalating. And part of it is not because that clergy will will make that much difference, but it'll, that that clergy will feel kind of the door in the in the face that you felt already. And you know, sometimes uh, as people of faith, we feel okay to say like, okay, please pray for me because of some health problems that I'm having. But we have a lot of challenges in terms of saying like, well, let's pray about this this economic fight that I'm having, you know, and how I'm as, as the struggles that I'm having. And I think that that sometimes has to happen not only through the bishop component, but from the pulpit component. Fifteen is completely successful. Hey, you're going to have fun with this one. Uh, and fast food workers across the country belong to robust industrial unions. What happens next? <laughs> I think the goal right now is to, sort of as that question suggests, is to um, organize the entire industry um, to a point where we can bring some of these employers to the negotiating table um, and uh, work out some kind of an agreement that would make uh, improvements for these workers across the board. Um, what, and then what happens after that? Yeah, when you accomplish this goal. Yeah. What's the next goal? Well, it's got more work by this one. Which, 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 yeah, yeah, the, the, rest of, the rest of the workers. I don't know. What the, um, yeah, I mean, you know, other, other low-wage sectors, uh, you know, I mean, there are workers that uh, are, are low-wage workers that don't belong to the fast food industry or that don't belong to the, the current targets that are typically focused on. You know, right now, it's, there's been a big focus on the burgers, uh, McDonald's, Burger King, Wendy's. Um, but, you know, I think it needs to expand beyond that. The, the direction that the U.S. economy is heading in is one that is particularly reliant on um, the service industry for providing jobs for people. And so if we as a movement don't take that into account and don't move in that direction, I mean, we will become irrelevant. Unions in general will become irrelevant. I, I hope that is the Yeah, I ask, um I'm always late to the game because I'm an old guy. Um, I asked Colin, why fast food? Because Colin came to us and said, listen, we want to do this. It's a national thing. SEIU is the big <coughs> national supporter. 1199 was very um, uh, reluctant because so we said, we got all these home care workers and nursing home workers and all these other people that do human services. Why don't we do a fight for 15 for them? And Colin said, listen, this is about publicity and public education. Everybody goes to fast food. They'll get it. They know what goes on there because they can see it, right? And you're talking about the invisible workers. So there's a whole lot of other places to go after fast food, but that's what convinced me. He said, this is really about getting message out, and that's why we picked this industry, and that's why SEIU is supporting it. And it's, again, it's a starter, it's not an ender. Yeah, but for those of you who were here this morning, who was the lowest paid worker who spoke? The adjunct, who ended up making $6 an hour, which is half of what the fast food workers are making, and they want more. So, yeah. <coughs> Not half. No, less. Sorry. Less. Okay. Jake, here's another question. Uh, someone wants you to talk about associate membership in unions uh, for community members who don't belong to bargaining units. Um. I think it's a fantastic idea, and I think, I mean, it, my, my own experience in the, in the labor movement has been that, you know, we go into these shops, um, you know, there's a group of workers there that want to organize, and the majority of the time, uh, because of all the, the reasons that, that Bruce mentioned, uh, we wind up being unsuccessful. And so what then happens is we just walk away from that unit, which, you know, can often mean sometimes we lose these votes by a very small number, 
You know, so oftentimes that can mean walking away from hundreds of workers that wanted to form a union. And so an associate membership could mean um, maintaining contact and activity with those workers, just like workers are doing it uh, in fast food. They continue fighting around demands without a contract. Um, and potentially, you know, with, with the goal of maybe uh, raising the notion of having a, another NLRB election again in the future. But um, what I, the tendency that I've seen in the labor movement is that once we lose those votes, we walk away. And I think that's wrong. I don't, and I think it's, I think we shoot ourselves in the foot and we ignore all sorts of workers um, who are willing to stand up and fight for something better for themselves. Um, Jake, I asked that question. I misinterpreted what an associate member is. And I'm wondering, I mean, Bruce is talking about bringing, bringing the organizing to the community uh, and out of the workplace. And you talked about 100 people walking up there with, at Northridge with the Wendy's workers. Um, how can we make us, people who were up there with the Wendy's workers, be in some way officially connected with the union that we support, but we can't be members of. That, that, in other words, that there's another kind of association that I'm talking about. Yeah. I'd like to wear a Wendy's uniform and walk up saying, "I'm a Wendy's worker." And you know the scene in Wag the Dog when Conrad Breen comes wait, wait, wait. up. Say that again. Said, I don't know if you know the movie Wag the Dog, where uh, the, the Nero character comes in and there's a, the president's in trouble eleven days before the election. He's going to win. And Conrad Breed says, I'm working on it. I'm working on it. So we have an active proposal on that. It is, you obviously heard my frustrated tone in my remarks about the box that we're in. Uh, so we, are, we have, a, there is, a, in this computer and on the table, a proposal to do that in Rochester, which is hitting some tough sledding by people that say, well, if it doesn't lead to dues paying membership and it doesn't lead to a bargaining, I mean, I'm getting all that stuff, right? So some of why I said what I said today and will be distributed is in fact in support of a very specific associate membership. Now I should also say that I referred to a thing called the Labor Reporting Management, Labor Management Reporting Disclosure Act of 1959. Um, the kind of stuff that Luis talked about, the legal hoops and the legal restraints that unions are under, that's done through a union, are just Byzantine. It's unbelievable. Um, I'll give you one example of how you outlaw a union. During the Bush, there's a thing called an LM30. I'm an elected union official. And LM30 says that I, can, I, I have to report uh, any gift from an employer. Now, if you employ somebody, this isn't my employers, this is any employer. So, of a value of $250 or more. The Bush administration reduced that to $25. It's a felony if I don't report that. So if my lawyer, Mike Heron, buys me a hamburger and two beers, and I don't report that, now it's fine that I accept that, but if I don't report it by March 31st of the next fiscal year, it's a felony. So that's a trap, right? So you can't imagine the kind of other financial, there's a thing called an LM2, that's where they get a lot of stuff. I mean, it's unbelievable how bureaucratized the union business has become since that law and other enforcement. And for us, people say, well, why are you so wedded to stuff like you know, Obama and things like that? Um, there is a huge difference on that level in the United States Department of Labor. Every Republican president has chopped the hell out of everything in the Labor Department. OSHA, the, you know, all of the Fair Labor Standards stuff that Jeff, except the Prime Enforcement Division. And when a Democrat gets in, at least we get some relief. They say, well, you know, we're not gonna, we're not gonna put you in jail this week, Papa, for filling out page three, line 50 the wrong way. But the Republicans set that stuff up. So one of the other barriers we have in associate membership is how to collect dues and comply with the Byzantine federal stuff so there's some skin in the game. Because I'm a believer that, that when we organize workers, even if a, a modest amount, but they've gotta put some money in the game, right? That's membership, that's being, you know, that's being, uh, committed. So there is, there are active proposals on that. It was tried in the 80s. We're trying to find out why it didn't work. It's centered around a credit card and some benefit stuff and some other things, but but it's exactly where we're going. Um, I, I guess as far as, <coughs> as far as the fight for 15, I, I think, um, I mean, sort of in addition to what Bruce said, you know, uh, 
having some kind of um, having a form of membership that requires that people actually pay into the, the organization um, that they're a part of. Um, I think that's also important in that it allows that institution, that organization, to remain independent and not have to rely continuously on either fundraising or appealing to uh, uh, grants. Um, and in that sense, it allows them to remain independent um, and under the control of their membership, ideally. Um, but um, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. I mean, both of you. Something, some way to expand it. But as you were talking about dues, I'm thinking, oh no, do I pay for this new union or something, or do I pay my dues to Metro Justice? In other words, I'm creating another competitive, well, you know, uh, scenario here. Right, right now on the union cards that workers sign, it mentions, it lists the uh, Rochester Worker Organizing Committee, I think it says, as the collective bargaining agent. So if we were to go to a vote, that's the body which is Metro Justice. Um, that's that's the body that would be the collective bargaining agent for those orders if what if we took it to that point. So why why let me, maybe I'm maybe I'm naive here and really just don't have enough information. But you know places like the public library have the friends of the public library. It's 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 separate from the organization, but people who support the library can write checks. And so in this case, you wouldn't have to be a dues carrying union member. You could be a friend of the union. I wasn't when I mentioned uh, crowdsourcing, suggesting that members not pay dues. I, I absolutely agree with that philosophically, but it's a way to get, perhaps use even as a marketing campaign to allow people to support the union so that it's not part of the union, but there's money flowing into the coffers to begin to do the work around power and other things, and you have a greater network of people who are supportive allies who can put money, because that may be what they have, at 70 or 60 or 80, and not being able to be on the street, that could subsidize a membership for a member who is unemployed or any of those kinds of things. So I, I was only suggesting that in addition to a membership, not in place of a membership. I, I was just, uh, sorry, just, well, yeah, Barbara and I were just in Chicago, we had meetings at a local there uh, it used to be known as SEAU 880. It's not called uh, SEA Illinois Indiana Healthcare. They are the local that got hit, you know, 50,000 home care workers by this Harris v. Quinn thing. And so one of the reasons I, I took some extra time after the meetings I was in to talk <coughs> to their staff about what the, they do exactly, but it's an interesting culture thing. They do bank drafts because so few of the low wage child care home care workers actually have checked. Uh, and it, they started as an ACORN organization, so not a collective bargaining union, and signed people up association style. Because our problem in the union is exactly what, what you and Doug are saying. Unless you're in a bargaining unit, you're not a voting member of an organization, right? And um, it's, it's not like you can join Metro Justice, the Sierra Club, or whatever. It's not a free association thing. So we had an associate or association win, like you guys are talking about, you know. but. Uh, AFL abandoned that for reasons that I have not yet found out. I tried to find the people in the in the late 80s because if they launched it, it was a really serious organizing effort, and then it disappeared by the 90s. So I'm not sure why. I don't want to make, as Luis said, I don't make, want to make the same mistakes as my father. So. Could I, could I make a comment? Sure. Uh, I recently, within the last year, with the taxi drivers of Rochester, came to us and they wanted to to unionize with us. Okay. We could not unionize them. Okay, they could come in as an association. Okay, there's, I think we're missing the definition of an association and a union. Okay, they're two separate things. Workers cannot be, uh, uh, the taxi drivers are considered independent operators. Okay, they're quote unquote like, like a supervisor position. They cannot go into a union. Okay, so that's the difference. The only way that they can get, and we can't even represent them, all we can do for the taxi drivers here in Rochester are advocate for them and set them up in um, something that they can use for like, a, um, like a, a work association. We can give them training, uh, and they, cannot, they don't pay dues, 
they have to give an association fee. So they, are, they cannot be union members. There are a lot of workers that are considered in that category, and that's why they can't be union. I think that's just the difference. I think that's what's confusing. There is one other thing that you can do for them, and that's patronize them. Yes, definitely. Um, yep, definitely. We've gotten to a couple of minutes after three, and um, we only have the room until three. I don't know if anybody's going to come and evict us, but uh, I think we should probably wrap this up. Uh, I want to 